The topic tonight, as advertised, is the nexus of neoliberalism, postmodernism, and psychohegemony, or dominating people through the invention of crisis in contemporary society. Mark Ahrens, scientist, engineer, a commentator, and I'm sure other things. I'd like you to welcome Mark Ahrens, please. Thank you for having me. I've been here once before. Uh, you may, you may uh, be glad that you may be glad to offer that disclaimer by the end of it. <laughs> okay. um, but uh, you know, I think uh, it's very valuable to have this kind of public discussion for the three of you. And if I start getting slow or falling asleep, I've got an emergency cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to try. I've got. I'm going to try and read the notes off my phone because it turns out my phone is faster than my computer is. So, uh, it's time to upgrade my computer. 4G. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean the CPU. Anyway, so uh, yes, the the title is neoliberalism, postmodernism, and psychohegemony, and I had to double check that because it is a mouthful, and it was kind of designed to be intriguing. Uh, the subtitle, I'm, I'm afraid. We're, this was arrived at in a bit of a rush, and it's not really relevant to what I'm going to talk about, this uh, um, change in, in crisis stuff. <coughs> Naomi Klein writes about that sort of stuff quite famously. Anyway, so uh, now, ideally, we would be here for 14 hours, and I would be able to say everything I want to say. Uh, there is a the whole purpose of what I would like to say is a kind of a, uh, a big picture view. I would like to convey a big picture view and this amounts to connecting a whole lot of dots. The dots are really interesting. The big picture view is kind of dry but I think really important. So I have to try and trade off these, these two um, desires to, to convey this big picture view that I would like to convey but also to keep it interesting with these little uh, vignettes that I think of kind of compelling, motivating, and interesting. So, neoliberalism, started my stopwatch. Neoliberalism, uh, well, neoliberalism is a fairly common term. Um, it's also known as neoclassical economics. And this is a very common mainstream branch of economics. And so Steve Keen, who's a, an economist I follow a bit, uh, he tells us that 85% of academic economists are neoliberal econo uh, economists or neoclassical e economists. And it's also been known as economic rationalism in Australia in particular. Postmodernism is kind of a, a broad and, and vague term, but that's kind of the nature of postmodernism, to be broad and vague. And there was a, an explanation I came across once of existentialism, which is similarly broad and vague. Uh, which I, I liked because it started off by saying that existentialism is not a philosophy, it's a spirit. And in that mm -hmm. sense, postmodernism is a spirit. And so it has all of these sort of corollaries, not all of which are free of contradictions either. Um, but the core of that spirit is essentially that everyone is biased, <laughs> that there's no such thing as unbiased truth. And the last term is one that I invented uh, to sort of play this postmodern game by coming up with a funky sounding term to hang ideas on. And by psychohegemony, I, I mean this uh, process of using uh, sciences, uh, purported sciences of the mind to, uh, to dominate people. You know, so there's cultural hegemony. I'm talking about uh, psychohegemony. Okay, so... Um, now, my purpose is to, for one thing, to try and get across some ideas of how absurd some of these ideas are when you, when you go into detail. And so those are the, these are the, the, um, the vignettes that I would, I'd like to sort of explain. Uh, so I'll start with economics and neoliberalism and try and get that out of the way as quickly as possible because it's, it's quite dry. But it's, of course, you know, dominates all of us. It's very important. It's remarkable how absurd some of it is. You know, and we're all very used to saying economics is absurd and, and it's the, the dismal science and, and economists make uh, 
uh, whether men look good. Mm. And that, that's their job. And we laugh and we shrug, and then we go on and, and we say, well, maybe it's better than nothing. Or, and we just put up with it, uh, despite the fact that we, so many of us acknowledge that economics doesn't reflect reality very well. Well, <clears throat> Steve Keen has popularised ideas that others have come up with mostly, that are quite old, that suggests that um, economics doesn't reflect mathematics very well, mm. which I think is a, a more fundamental problem. It's a, it's a very grave error. Um, I, I mentioned that to someone at a, a Renewing the Left conference a, a few months ago, someone from the School of Political Economy at Sydney Uni, and she didn't think this was very important. She didn't think that the person on the street would appreciate that, that was a big deal which I thought was quite condescending to the person on the street. Um, so one of, one of the ideas that's greatly flawed, there are, whole, there are several ideas that are greatly flawed, for example, in just the discussions of demand and supply. So you know you have these uh, demand, demand, comes, demand goes down as price goes up for me, which is that for you, and supply would like to go up as price goes up which is that way for you. And Economics 101 tells you that in the, uh, where these two curves intersect, that's a unique point, and it's called the equilibrium point. It maximises profit to the producer. And then by further explanation, it also serendipit serendipitously maximises the utility, in other words, the benefit to all of society. Now, it turns out that, in general, it's not possible to have a generally, for you, upward sloping demand curve. Uh, and in fact, this has been known since the 70s. It's known as the Sonnenschein Mandel de Broglie theorem. And it's also known, that the, the consequence is known as the, the general equilibrium failure, the failure of actually having a unique equ equilibrium point. Because once you don't have a generally upward sloping curve, there's no guarantee of a unique intersection point. And so the, that uniqueness, that expectation that there is one unique optimal point is gone. And that's one of the major tenets of uh, economics. You know, it's taught in undergraduate economics still, and yet it's completely wrong. And they've known this since the 70s. In fact, they've known it since the 50s. But when they first came across the proof of this uh, general equilibrium failure, a fellow called uh, William Gorman, proved this failure, but then in the text concluded the exact opposite. And this has been described, perhaps unfairly, to people labelled as autistic, as autistic economics, because he saw this and then he just ignored it and went, oh, everything's okay. And in fact, he'd proven something very fundamentally wrong with the conventional wisdom. <clears throat> the same result basically applies to the supply curve. So neither curve is generally upward or downward sloping. They, they have kinks in them, so there's absolutely no guarantee of a unique intersection point. And uh, in certain extreme cases, like in the uh, potato famine in Ireland, you get very wild and crazy supply and demand curves for various reasons. Uh, but in general, it's, it's not true. And in, Steve Keen assures me that in reality, it's very often quite far from, from that picture. And then the next part of this uh, Economics 101, is that that purported equilibrium point is uh, uh, maximises the benefit, <coughs> the utility to society. And this is actually based on flawed mathematics. This is based on the result of trying to shoehorn high school calculus onto a problem that's too complex for it, basically. And that anyone with a first year education in science or engineering or, or math, certainly, uh, who's been exposed to multivariable calculus, yeah, multi um, it's, it's very easy to show that actually this is complete rubbish. And that is the core ethical claim of neoliberalism, of economic rationalism. And it's completely false. And this is quite remarkable. And yet, well, I think it's remarkable. And yet we put up with it. So. Uh, Maybe uh, just as one final thing on economics, uh, as a sort of a motivating point, I'll just very briefly talk about Europe. 
Now, obviously, Europe's been in a lot of crisis for several years now. And Spain is a very interesting example for a number of reasons, in particular because it's actually very similar to Australia in, in the nature of the crisis that's happened there. Uh, but <coughs> we haven't had a collapse yet. Maybe we will. But um, it's basically a housing bubble. It's been a housing... The global financial crisis has been a global housing bubble. It's been a bubble of debt fueled asset speculation around the world, which, by the way, creates the potential... When you stop taking on debt, if so much of your GDP is actually fueled by debt, you actually go into recession just for taking on less debt. And this was recognised in the Depression. This was an explanation for the Depression from an economist called Irving Fisher. Uh, and that was completely marginalised, that idea. It was called debt deflation. It was completely marginalised, and now that it's happening again, basically, people are starting to talk about it <laughs> once more. Um, but the case in Spain is that the European Central Bank uh, sets interest rates, and yet most of the other fiscal the government spending decisions are still located within the various European governments. So in other words, they've centralised monetary policy and kept uh, fiscal policy decentralised in each of the member states. And, and after the fact, in hindsight, it seems completely obvious that this is a recipe for disaster. What happened in Spain was they set the interest rates Europe-wide, sorry, the European Central Bank set interest rates Europe-wide, uh, which were biased towards the needs of Germany being the powerhouse of Europe, mm -hmm. yet Spain had um, higher inflation. So it was basically free money. You'd go out, get a mortgage on a house, and the inflation was high enough, the value of the house was going to go up quicker than, than the interest payments on the house, and so it was free money. So everybody did this, and it caused a housing bubble. And this is because they separated <coughs> the fiscal... They centralised the <coughs> monetary policy and kept <coughs> the fiscal policy separate. So in hindsight, people say, well, you, you, you either centralise both of them, and a Angela Merkel's made some comments about this, about... You know, which people are taking as a sort of ominous sign about Germany consolidating its power across Europe economically. Or the alternative is to break up this, um, uh, the, the monetary policy and, and get rid of the euro. But the remarkable thing is that we had all of these experts and none of them ever... Uh, well, there were enough that, that didn't say anything, that, that they couldn't see this coming. And it's, in, in hindsight, it's e extremely straightforward and uh, not remarkable at all. And so we rely on these experts who are <coughs> not doing a very good job, to say the least. Uh, now, I will move on to an area that I think is really exciting because it's so scandalous. <laughs> and this is uh, where the psychohegemony comes in, and this is uh, psychiatry. Uh, so I will uh, I'll try and keep an eye on the time. So I will start for example, with something that is probably, the, I would say, the biggest scandal you've probably never heard of that's happening mm. right now. And this is the case of... Sorry, that's <laughs> my, my phone. <laughs> I won't worry about that. Uh, this is the case of modern antidepressants, and these are the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. There's been a bit of talk about it, but I'm absolutely amazed at how little seriousness this issue is actually given. Now, the, the core claim with SSRIs uh, is that the trials have been done comparing SSRIs, which have side effects in many cases, even something as simple as a dry mouth, uh, and they've been compared in trials uh, against placebos, which are sugar pills generally, which have no side effects. And this is a standard trial design, this, is, this came about because uh, medicine, in its transition to medical science, said we need to, it acknowledged there was this placebo effect that people get better sometimes just from being treated, regardless of what the treatment is. It can be a completely useless treatment, but people feel better just um, by being treated. And uh, so in order to account for this placebo effect, they designed the double-blind drug placebo trial. Now, this is routinely referred to in medical science as the gold standard of medicine, of medical science, sorry. And this is what took medicine to medical science. <coughs> so this is a really important trial design. And as it turns out, uh, there's a real problem with it. The problem is, 
And this has happened with SSRIs, with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the modern antidepressants. The problem is, when you take an active medication and, and give it to half of your trial subjects, and you give a um, sugar pill to the other half, there is the potential that the side effects in the, in the group that's on the active medication break the double blind. In other, wor um, in other words, well, well blind, the blinding of the experiment means that nobody's supposed to know whether they're on the active mm -hmm. pill or the placebo. Uh, and the whole point of this is so that they're in the same psychological state of information. So that uh, any placebo effect, hopefully, if you have enough people, is the same in both groups. Um, you do, you can keep the information the same in both groups to achieve this. And so by, by breaking the double blind, um, each group has different amounts of information about which, whether it's on the active drug or the placebo. And by comparing an active medication against uh, a sugar pill with no side effects, there is a very real potential to break the double blind. And in fact, there, there are studies uh, with the previous generation of antidepressants that were done, which showed that in, in I think it was 80% of cases patients could work out when they were on the active medication. And in 90% of cases, their treating physicians could work this out. So it's, it's, it's been studied in the past with, with similar drugs. And it's uh, very likely, at the very least, it begs the question of the drug companies to retest mm -hmm. the drugs and, and redo the trials. And they're never done. And, and you know, this is uh, very conspicuous that they're never done. They're never retested. In fact, there are better trial designs that are known, and one fairly obvious one is to is to take, instead of a sugar pill as a placebo, to take a pill which has similar side effects, but is known not to cause the same, uh, not to have the same effect that you're interested in. In this case, an antidepressant. And in fact, uh, a psychiatrist, a sort of radical, somewhat radical psychiatrist in the UK, called Joanna Moncrief, she did a a systematic review of the journal record to find out if this had ever been done. She found no such trials with SSRIs, but she did find such trials with the previous generation, which are the tricyclic antidepressants, the TCAs. Mm. And uh, there were nine studies done, which is relatively few. <laughs> and um, but what they, what she found was that eight of those nine studies found no advantage to the antidepressant over the placebo, over the active placebo. Mm. A only one found an advantage out of the nine. Um, now, you might think, well, that was the old generation, things are better now. But in fact, the conventional wisdom is that the current generation of antidepressants work worse than the previous generation. Mm. And the reason why they switched, the ostensible reason why they switched from the previous to the current generation is because the uh, previous generation had worse side effects. In fact, the real reason was probably because the patents were expiring. <laughs> but but the, official, <laughs> the official reason is the one I, uh, I gave you. So you have a case where the previous um, drug was actually is actually still believed to work better than the existing drug, and yet this sy systematic review by Jenna Moncrief says it, it doesn't work better than active placebo. So the current drug is probably no better than an active placebo. And in comparative trials, um, where they compare the old generation to the new generation directly, well, the old generation does work better, but that fits in with the placebo interpretation. It's just more likely to break the double blind. And, and so people go, hey, I'm, I'm on the active medication. This is great. I feel better already. So uh, this is a, you know, a really simple these are really simple questions. You don't need a degree to understand any of this, to question all of this, and yet, of course, we outsource so much of our thinking to experts. Um, I might add that Jonah Moncrief's article that I mentioned, that was published in the Cochrane Library, which is a very prestigious journal, and all of the facts I, I will be able to end up telling you come from very mainstream sources. It's not from um, conspiracytheory.com or something like that. <laughs> uh, one of the, um, the real nail in the coffin for SSRIs, by the way, is that it turns out there was a French company that marketed a, another alternative antidepressant, which are SSREs, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Enhancers. Mm 
<laughs> and do the exact opposite of SSRIs and produce exactly the same result. <laughs> so, you know, this raised very serious questions about these drugs. Yet this was not long ago the biggest selling class of drugs in the Western world. And what's extremely important is that there is no link to violence with these drugs, violence to others and to self. It's recognised that these drugs increase the risk of suicide. That in itself is remarkable, an antidepressant that increases the risk of suicide. Uh, and, and again, I'm not making this up. If you buy these drugs in the US, they come with a warning label on the box, which doesn't occur here, which is the highest level FDA warning, the Food and Drug Administration, the US, which warns of these risks. So it's as official as that, the highest level warning label written on the box if you buy them in the United States. Uh, so, there are... Uh, Sorry? Box. Yeah, the black box warning label. That's right. The, the highest uh, level available in, uh, in the FDA. Uh, there are so many reasons <coughs> to question the conventional wisdom of psychiatry. Uh, there's a really interesting story about antipsychotics. And of course, by the way, if, if what I'm telling you makes you scared of these drugs and you happen to be on them, it's a very bad, bad idea to go off. Mm -hmm. Straight away. <laughs> See you lose either way. <coughs> well, <coughs> one one of the one of the reasons is they're also addictive, but in a sense that is not always recognised as an addiction in medicine. They're addictive in the sense not that they sort of trigger your reward centres in the brain, but they're addictive in the sense that you become habituated to them and your body body chemistry adjusts. And then when you stop taking them, you have to readjust. So you have to come off them very carefully. And there are there are some. Uh, Psychiatrists who, who, who specialise or who recommend this. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a very interesting story about uh, antipsychotics, though. There's a, a neuroscientist called Nancy Anderson, and in 2003, she, she's, a, she's a neuroscientist and psychiatrist and very reputable in the field. In 2003, she published a longitudinal study of MRI scans on the brains of schizophrenics. And what she found was, <clears throat> and what she published was, that the brains of people diagnosed as schizophrenic shrink over time. And this was one of the first, you know, this is the holy grail of, of biological psychiatry, a, a physical correlate of, of one of their purported diseases. Um, but a few people had their doubts, I suppose, and, and then in, she published several papers in 2003 on that result. And then in 2005, some, some animal model studies came out where macaques had been injected with antipsychotics at, at a similar level in the blood serum. And what they found with these macaques, now of course they're much smaller and they have a different metabolism, but their brains shrank as well, and none of them have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, of course. But their brains shrank at a rate of 10% over two years. Now they have a different metabolism. Uh, so that emerged uh, from some other researchers in 2005 and that sort of forced Nancy Anderson's hand. She still didn't do anything about it until 2008 when she only mentioned it in the New York Times article when she was interviewed and they asked her why didn't you, why haven't you published anything about this? She said oh, I don't want to scare people off these very valuable drugs. You know, but if they're shrinking the brain, you have to question, among other things, how valuable they are. But also... She probably wanted to prove her theory, though, to be sure. She's a scientist. To be sure, to be sure. Yes. Um, well, she didn't publish anything until, uh, in a peer-reviewed journal until 2011. she lose all her funding from the drug companies. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't publish anything until 2011 in a peer-reviewed journal. So, and this, so it's now official, they, they shrink the brain. Um, I'll try and just mention a few things really quickly. There, there's a, 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 there was a known strategy of the American Psychiatric Association. This is documented by, among others, an investigative journalist called Robert Whitaker in a book called Anatomy of an Epidemic. Epidemic. There was a known strategy, strategy of the American Psychiatric Association to re-medicalise psychiatry. Uh, and it involved... Um, PR and, and so on. And this was all intended to, to take psychiatry from being the, one of the worst pay, paid branches of medicine to one of the best paid, as it is now. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it's very 
you don't make much money spending an hour talking with people. You can make a lot more money spending five or ten minutes doling out medications. <laughs> um, there's the issue of brain damage therapy. So I mentioned the um, antipsychotics. Well, there's metrovol con metrazole convulsion therapy, EC uh, ECT, electroconvulsion therapy, insulin coma therapy, barbiturate coma therapy, lobotomy, the infamous lobotomy. There's a whole history of therapies that are essentially brain damage therapy. And it raises the question, you know, is it really therapy if you're just sort of slightly killing the person, you know? And it raises this old adage of killing the patient to cure the disease. Mm. At the you know the extreme end, you can cure any anybody of anything if you, if you just shoot them in. in the head. <laughs> Someone's got anxiety. It's a pretty yeah. surefire cure for anxiety. Works every time. <laughs> <laughs> Works every time. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh. Um, mm. I, I'll mention also just because it's an Australian sort of connection. There was Pat McGorry. Oh, I wasn't actually going to say his name, but I've said it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I shouldn't have written it down. Um, now, he was, he was Australian of the Year in, in 2010, and he was pushing this idea called psychosis risk syndrome, and he said that he could predict uh, which teenagers in particular were at ultra-high risk of developing psychosis in the future. And he was pushing for this syndrome, which is actually a pre-syndrome syndrome, if you think about it, because without any underlying etiology, without any underlying understanding of it, what a purported disease is. It's nothing but a syndrome. So schizophrenia is a syndrome. And um, uh, psychosis risk syndrome then is a pre-syndrome syndrome. <laughs> so uh, he said he was, he was pushing for this to be included in the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual, which is known as the, the Bible of Psychiatry. But it turned out he had no evidence his claim that he could uh, predict this psychosis risk syndrome. <laughs> and in fact, nobody had really done any research on it. The only reason why he was the world's foremost expert was because nobody was game to, game <laughs> to call themselves an expert except he him. <laughs> and then a couple of years later, finally some research was done in the UK. And they were using uh, cognitive behavioural therapy with these teenagers, and then so the control group weren't getting any therapy at all. And they found the false positive rate for predicting psychosis was 92%. So 92% wow. of these teenagers mm. that he was planning on drugging and had done back in the 90s as well, which is published in Time magazine, but nobody ever talks about it in Australia. They were talking about it in the US, but not what was going on here, but not in Australia. 92% um, of the time, it was a, a false diagnosis, and he was giving them these dangerous drugs that we know now shrink the brain. Um, oh. I missed that point before, by the way. The, the key thing about Nancy Anderson's research, which she missed, was that it wasn't schizophrenia that was shrinking the brain, it was the drugs. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm. Which ones was it? Yeah. The TCAs or the SSRIs? The antipsychotics, sorry. Yeah, no more stellas than So both, both um, the old generation, the neuroleptic antipsychotics, and the, the existing generation, the atypical Ethylene. antipsychotics. Ethylene. And... Uh, oh, like Zepressor and things like that. Uh, I think, yeah, I think so. I've forgotten a lot of the names. That's uh, an anti-schizophrenic. So any, yeah. Antipsychotics as opposed to antidepressants. <coughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and in fact, what, what her research also showed, by the way, is that they shrink the brain, um, or the effects of drug, uh, illicit drug abuse and alcohol abuse actually didn't show up through the noise <laughs> floor of her studies, but the antipsychotics did. So they're worse than wow. illicit drug abuse cool. and alcohol abuse wow. in that respect. Um, anyway, getting back to uh, Pat McGorry, and uh, so eventually he was criticised, but there was no, there was there were very few people in Australia who were willing to actually criticise him. This was such a powerful bandwagon. It ended up taking Alan Francis, who was actually the the lead editor of the DSM four, which was the prevailing edition of the DSM up until May this year. Oh, really? And he's they've just changed it in May to the DSM five, and Alan Francis was campaigning against the editor of the previous edition. And he said of Pat McGorry, he said, he's by far the most powerful psychiatrist in the world. He's a yeah. brilliant politician, but a dark cloud surrounds the silver lining of having one psychiatrist in a position of almost unopposed influence. He has developed the messianic blind spot 
uh, making him an unreliable evaluator of scientific evidence. This is the Australian of the Year in 2010. So the, the, the point to learn from this is, you know, this is not a, a US specific, specific thing. thing. Mm -hmm. the, you know, it was a huge bandwagon and it was a central uh, plank, I think, in, in um, Julia Gillard's win in, in the election that she won. And Get Up made it a, a big a big issue. And I actually believed in all of this stuff at, that, uh, stuff at that stage, and I supported Get Up in all of this. And then I learnt more about it, and, you know, I admitted I was wrong, and I, I pestered them a little bit, and I said, you know, I tried to get some kind of admission out of them after all of this criticism from Alan Francis, and they, they've never really sort of dealt with that. They just walked away from it. And I, I have... The ABC has done that as well. He was their go-to guy for, for a long time. On mental health, and they, and then, they, they, they you know, they didn't sort of <laughs> readdress the issue. They didn't say, well, it's more complex than we thought. They just walked away from it, said nothing more about it. Which is headspace is so successful. Well, head, headspace is an interesting point because they're in 2011, in the budget in 2011, they, that was the one that Gillard won, and they set aside 2.2 billion dollars for mental health funding. Yeah. What this, that? this was based on one report by six people, mm -hmm. which was a three point something billion dollar, dollars worth of recommendations. Two of those people were Ian Hickey and Pat McGorry. Out of the $2.2 .2 billion in the end, they got half a billion for their own pet projects. So the name of this think tank essentially was, was ironically the Independent Mental Health uh, reform group. <laughs> <laughs> so it's in the name, so it must be true. Oh, it must be. Yeah, yeah, independent of two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, there are so there are so many more issues I'd like to get into, mm. um, but I'd better stop. I'll just mention uh, the issue of money. You know, mm. money is, mm. is so biasing, not just biological psychiatry, but all pharmacology. <coughs> I think I brought a book with me. Uh, uh, by a fellow called Ben Goldacre, who's, again, you know, these aren't cranks. This is a, an epidemiologist who writes for The Guardian as a science writer. This is a mm. book, Bad Pharma. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he describes the situation in pharmacology at the moment as murderous, nothing less than murderous. Um, well, Maybe I'll, I'll just give you read a tiny bit that I was thinking of reading. He says, uh, this whole book is about meticulously defending every assertion in the paragraph that follows. Drugs are tested by the people who manufacture them mm. in poorly designed trials on yeah. hopelessly small numbers of weird unrepresentative patients <laughs> yeah. and analysed using techniques uh, which are flawed by design in such a way that they exaggerate the benefits of the treatments. And I have no doubt mm. that mm. this uh, issue with the placebo mm. effect yeah. was deliberate at this stage. Yeah. I know a couple of people who work in that field and I, I used to think it was an accident, but I don't think it is now. No, I've worked in that um, <laughs> Unsurprisingly, these trials tend to produce results that favour the manufacturer. When trials throw up results the companies don't like, they are perfectly entitled mm. to hide them from doctors and patients. So we only ever see a distorted picture of any drug's effects. Regulators see most of the trial data, but only from early on in a drug's life. And even then, they don't uh, give, this doctor to, uh, give this data to doctors or patients, or even to other parts of government. This distorted evidence is then communicated and applied in a distorted fashion in their 40 years of practice after leaving medical school. Doctors hear about what works through ad hoc tra oral traditions from sales reps, colleagues or journals, but those colleagues can be in the pay of drug companies, often undisclosed, and the journals are too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so are the patient groups. And finally, academic papers, which everyone thinks of as objective, are often covertly planned and written by people who work directly for the companies without disclosure. Sometimes whole academic journals are even owned outright by one drug company. Yeah. Aside from all this, for several of the most important and enduring problems in medicine, we have no idea what the best treatment is because it's not in anyone's financial interest to conduct mm -hmm. any trials at all. Mm -hmm. These are ongo ongoing problems and although people have claimed to fix many of them, for the most part they have failed. So all these problems persist, but worse than ever, because now people can pretend that everything is fine after all. So that's what he intends to prove in those 400 odd pages, or demonstrate in, in that book. Um, the Economist says this is a book that deserve, deserves to be widely read because anyone who does not read it cannot help feeling both uncomfortable and angry. And there's other very mainstream praise for that book. 
Uh, so money is a big issue. Uh, there are a whole lot of other issues, but I'll, I'll, I'd like to say a tiny bit about psychology because there are some very interesting stories here. I'll just very quickly mention there is a direct intellectual link from the founder of positive psychology, a guy known as Martin Zeligman, who started off by torturing dogs and working out what happened. Oh, mm. There's a direct intellectual line from that to the torture program at Guantanamo Bay. This is uh, <coughs> explained by a New Yorker investigative journalist called Jane Mayer, who also published a book called The Dark Side, a colon and then a long subtitle. Um, so this raises all sorts of questions about what that theory is really telling us. Is it a theory of resilience or is it a theory of torture? Well, the two things are really opposite sides of the same coin. And so if we're telling people, you know, if we're talking about resilience, uh, at some point are we not just telling them to put up with things they shouldn't really be putting up with, you know? And what does it say about society if you need torture resistance training in order to, to cope with it? <laughs> Um, I will uh, quickly mention Buddhism, though, because this is uh, the humanist society, and there are some ideas from Buddhism that come up more and more in psychology. There was one that I heard recently called Radical Acceptance, which I find kind of challenging, you know. The idea that something is so radical, so hard to accept, that you just have to accept it. Well, maybe those are the things that you shouldn't accept, you know. Uh, it's sort of passed off as wisdom, but at some point, of course, um, there comes a point where you sh we should accept. And in fact, the history of Tibet is a great example of that, mm. because Tibet was actually not a very pleasant country, mm. um, despite you know, all of the, the things Dalai we hear. Lama. Sorry? <laughs> the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama and so on. <laughs> well, you know, the, da the Dalai Lama has... has admitted to be having links to the CIA. No. <laughs> it's true. It's, I mean, it, should, yeah. it, should, it shouldn't be surprising, of course, because, you know, this is all after the, the Chinese invasion. But he was on a stipend from the CIA for, I think, over 10 years. And his two brothers um, were involved in training with, with the US military, training guerrillas and parachuting them back in. And his eldest brother's been described as, as near as makes no difference to a CIA agent. Uh, and he's admitted this, but he says, well, you know, I didn't know anything about it, and it was bad judgment on my brother's part, and so on. Uh, but the history of Buddhism in general is, is, is one of profound inequality, a society where a very large, over 90% of the population, was serfs to monasteries. Mm -hmm. You had a tiny uh, clergy class, and then you had a small middle class of several percent of, you know, accountants and, and, and uh, merchants and so on that you need. And then everybody else was indentured to uh, this clergy or, or various monasteries, and they inherited those responsibilities from their parents. So they had to do all this work, and then they had to feed themselves. Unlike a slave, they had to figure out how they were going to feed themselves as well. Mm -hmm. And all of this is maintained through uh, very internalizing ideas, like uh, from uh, not dissimilar to psychology, things in psychology. Uh, borrow. So, telling people effectively, you know, to have to internally reconfigure themselves in order to cope with this reality. It's their responsibility to, uh, to, to internally accommodate instead of changing the world around them. And so, <coughs> you know, when these ideas, for example, are very mainstream, they come from psychology or psychiatry, you know, they're potentially very dangerous and, you know, they historically are associated with oppression. And, look, you could say the same thing about the Catholic Church as well. Mm -hmm. um, I heard a radical um, theologian the other night decrying um, Emperor Constantine adopting uh, Christianity for the Roman Empire and declaring, he said, why do you think he called himself the 13th Apostle? <laughs> because it's, a very useful, um, it's very useful for an emperor to preach meekness to, to the people he's governing. <laughs> I, I'll just uh, briefly mention actually social work as well because uh, social work is quite remarkable in that actually in the, in the 70s social work in a fit of honesty showed of itself to do more harm than good most of the time. 
And among social sciences, I, I think this probably suggests a kind of naivety. It didn't understand how the game was played. And there were there was a this was mostly pushed by, or predominantly pushed by a fellow called Joel Fisher. He published a paper. He published a number of things, but he published a famous paper in 1978 called "Does Anything Work?" <laughs> and you know, he, he found that. Uh, social work didn't work very well. Well, by the early 80s, he changed his mind. Uh, but not everybody was convinced. Now, there are there have always been a sort of minority of sceptics, even within social work academia. One of them is called William Epstein. And he's very interesting because he published... He undertook one of the great uh, journal spoofs in history. And in, in this event, uh, he wrote... Uh, he wrote a whole range of um, of papers, basically saying the same thing, but half of them had conclusions that showed social work in a good light, and half showed social work in a bad light. And what he found was that there was a journal bias, particularly from um, all but the the six most reputable social work journals. And but worse than that, he he found all sorts of <coughs> Um, things, I suppose, that would be categorised as, as unprofessional from, from journal editors. Uh, poor judgment. Not he, he put deliberate errors in all of these papers, you know. Bad uh, trial designs and things like this, and they didn't pick up on any of this. In fact, he, he plagiarised a very famous, famous social work paper at the time. And even and put a, a clue in there, put a reference <laughs> to the original journal, and only two out of 146 editors picked up on this. <laughs> well, my, uh, some of those editors were from allied professions like psychology and so on, but most of them were social work journal editors, and they didn't pick up on it. Um, so journal bias, people like William Epstein would say, would be what's one of the things that's happened since Joel Fisher showed that more often than not, social work does more harm than good. For his trouble, he was pursued then by the National Association of Social Workers <laughs> in the US because they said he'd experimented on these editors without uh, <laughs> their ethical prior knowledge. Without their prior <laughs> knowledge, exactly. And, and they said this, uh, this was a violation of you know, ethical practice, that he should be testing their professionalism in this way. They were just embarrassed they didn't pick it up. <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, so, you know, that says something. And other people like Epstein and a, a few um, a few other more radical social workers have decried the increasing reliance since I suppose since Joel Fisher published his stuff in the 70s social work became very reliant on the language of mental health to shift responsibility from social structures onto the individuals mm -hmm. and say that you know it's a problem of brain chemistry and so on but, um, well, I mentioned SSRIs. Um, I didn't mention more broadly, actually, that the whole serotonin hypothesis is false. It's demonstrably false. This idea that low serotonin causes depression. Over 90 trials have proven it to be false. Uh, and yet, organisations like Beyond Blue still state this for a fact. It, uh, and the whole reason, the, the original reason for actually believing the serotonin hypothesis was actually the apparent efficacy of SSRIs. So originally, um, the drugs appeared to work, which we now think is very easily explained as a placebo effect, and, and therefore they concluded that low serotonin causes depression. Anyway, these are the kinds of ideas that have floated around for decades, which are demonstrably false, uh, which take away, for, you know, take away the ability for an individual to be rationally in despair and say, you know, the world around me is nuts. <laughs> you know, it's not to tolerable. And instead they say, well, take a drug, reconfigure yourself inter internally, your brain chemistry is all messed up. And people like uh, William Epstein and a few others would say the same thing of social work. He, he, he wrote in one paper that uh, social work's continuing pursuit of an elusive psychological idealism mm -hmm. serves ideologically repugnant social motives. And more broadly in the uh, biological sciences, uh, there is a, a move now. Um, th there's a movement called, I suppose, meta-research, which is to medical science what, I suppose, philosophy of science was to physics with Karl Popper and so on. Uh, 
And there's a, a very prominent fellow uh, called John Ioannidis, and he's a very interesting guy. He basically studies trial designs and the statistics of trial designs in the, in the health sciences. Uh, he very famously and controversially pub published a paper in 2005 on PLOS Medicine, which is an open access journal, which is an issue in itself, by the way. A lot of these problems persist because the information is hidden in very expensive journals that only people in universities mm -hmm. have access to. Mm -hmm. But he published a paper in 2005 called Why Most Research Findings Are False. <laughs> and he started from a priori reasoning uh, about, uh, from probability theory. And just a few weeks ago, uh, his group published a paper on this uh, topic they call it the, the US effect. And what they found, they looked at um, psychiatry, at genetics and behavioural behavioral genetics. So areas where you have no real physical measurements, areas where you have some physical and some behavioral measurements, and areas like genetics where you have sort of purely um, physical measurements like gene sequencing and so on. And they did a very clever thing because of course the larger a trial is, the smaller the amount of noise you should see in the data. That's the whole reason why it's better to do larger trials. And so if if there's bias in the trial, it can swamp the noise. And that's what happens. That's what they found, in, uh, particularly in behavioural um, trials in psychiatry. You mentioned psychiatry explicitly. Uh, and especially in the US. And they call this the US effect. And they sort of discuss the role of careerism and how it's important to have a really... Um, radical groundbreaking result and this creates all these biases that, that in the end are swamping even the sample noise um, in the studies and you know I, I think that's a very clever way actually to look for bias myself uh, but that's a, only a few weeks ago that came out um, so his, his research is generally suggesting that and there is a problem with any sort of behavioral science and that is that you it's very hard to measure behavior. It's very hard to measure it like, like you can in physics with a, a meter ruler or a, a nonmeter or something like that. And because it's hard to measure and quantify this, there are sort of degrees of freedom within the measurement that allow bias to encroach on the measurement. And then when you add these sort of these aspects of career and professionalism and the need to, to get published in, in a big <coughs> journal, reputable journal and all this, it adds to all that pressure um, that creates bias. So, well, I should move on to a little bit about postmodernism. So I mentioned uh, the idea that postmodernism is a spirit in a sense, and it, it's a spirit that's obsessed with bias. Uh, and essentially, this spirit asserts that everyone is biased. And so it seeks to counter that, seeks to counter prevailing biases, the prevailing biases of modernism, really. Um, and in that sense, it seeks to be anti-elitist. One of the sort of ways of encapsulating the idea of the spirit of postmodernism is that it acknowledges there are many ways of knowing things, not just one. Mm -hmm. And so it, it uh, re reacts against rationalism for trying to suggest that there's ever one answer to anything. <coughs> and it's also described as, as relativism, so there's no single absolute answer, it's all sort of relative. Now one of the key figures in uh, postmodernism is Michel Foucault, who's a French philosopher or historian or, well he, he's recognized I suppose as a, as a philosopher. Uh, now his life story is a little bit interesting because he was, he was gay and as a young gay man when psychiatry said uh, it was mental illness to be gay, mm. he was, we, we know he was sent by his wealthy father for um, psychotherapy. And we can assume that the psychotherapist tried to cure him of his homosexuality. Uh, and he spent his whole career dealing with the idea of power and authority, you know, in a professional philosophical setting of writing about power and authority. And we can imagine that he was maybe sitting on a couch or whatever and uh, maybe asking himself, who is this man in front of me? Where does he get his authority to... To, to question my sexuality and uh, you know why does my sexuality have anything to do with him and, and so on uh, 
And as I said, he went on to have a whole career basically asking this question over and over again in all sorts of different settings, wrote several books on the issue of sexuality. But his sort of magnus opus was the history of madness. Uh, this was his PhD thesis, I think, uh, turned into his first book, which is only a few years ago finally been published in its entirety in English, which is... Wasn't that um, in, the, in the Age of Reason? As well, History of Madness in the Age of Reason? I think that was the oh, second half of the title. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've given up on the titles after. A long, long time ago, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so one of the issues he deals with uh, very strongly is, in this book is the historical conflation of poverty and madness. In mm. uh, his, Historically, analysing the historical record in, in Britain and France. Uh, now, I don't think... As I understand it, there was, at least early on, there was never really any doubt that uh, he was questioning the social sciences. He was questioning mm -hmm. this psychiatrist or psychotherapist that was questioning his sexuality and where his authority came from. And in those early days, perhaps he was considered a structuralist. So postmodernism started off from this movement called structuralism. And it's really uh, concerned with language very strongly, it comes out of linguists, mm -hmm. and then it talks about <coughs> binary opposites of words, for example, but ultimately it's about the power of language to control people, which is really no great, deeper an idea, or well, it's an important idea of course, very important, but you know, it's the same thing that George Orwell was, was, was describing mm -hmm. with Newspeak. Um, but when you're in that academic setting, you kind of have to build it up and build it up, and in fact over-specify it, which is what they did. So this idea of binary opposites is really <coughs> superfluous, and is one of the reasons why it sort of fell away, because it was basically over-specified as an idea. But that's what you have to do, and in particular in, um, in postmodernism. So... Um, Chomsky, Noam Chomsky talks a little bit about postmodernism and he, uh, he mentions that he, he doesn't have much patience for postmodernism. And he says yes, they deal in truths, but they deal in truisms. Mm. It's all pretty simple and you don't really need a degree for all of this stuff. Uh, but of course, then they build all of this sort of ornate structure around it. All of, the, all of these, uh, all this impenetrable language is, is one of the really famous aspects of postmodernism. Uh, now, one of the essential features of postmodernism is that they reject grand theories. So, they postmodernists criticise physics in funny ways sometimes, and it's entertaining because it's actually, you know, it's pretty easy to prove them wrong <laughs> in the case of physics. Um, and of course, yeah, they reject grand theories because they're obsessed with bias, and they say, well. These theories are the result of bias. They come usually, you know, traditionally from, from uh, white heterosexual men in universities, and, and therefore it must all be uh, wrong. And uh, I've got here the word theory. Theory is a funny word for me. My background's in science and engineering, and in you know, physics, and my background's in, in, in physics. In physics, of course, there's electromagnetic theory, there's quantum theory, uh, but there's no theory. <laughs> There's no theory of physics. So it's, to me, it's extraordinarily pompous to just talk about theory as though it is a theory of everything. But in saying that everyone else is biased, you're essentially saying, well, uh, we can challenge anything anybody else says because we know they're biased. And that's really sort of what it boils down to. Uh, and because of the reject this rejection of grand theories, uh, there is a, a promise in... Um, Postmodernism, which is a focus on individual narratives. So Marx, Marx and Marxism is about um, this grand theory of the pro progression of society to this teleological, meaning inevitable, end that, that uh, you know, the proletariat will rise up because it's the only obvious thing that can happen, and yet it never happened. <laughs> um, and, and they reject that as a grand theory, and they say, well, we, we promise to focus on individual narratives. Um, okay, I better hurry up. So, because, um, well, the, the problem with this promise is 
for one thing, it's essentially it, it's it's false. It's completely failed. So, uh, what happens instead of focusing on individual narratives is uh, uh, recognition politics, which you know, is commonly known as identity politics. Uh, now. Of course, those are very necessary issues, but there is a tension that's been recognised there. There's a sort of socialist cultural theorist called Nancy Fraser who has used these terms. She says that redistribution, politi redistribution politics, which is socialism and so on, has been displaced by recognition politics. So there's a position that says, well, they shouldn't be mutually exclusive, but they have become mutually exclusive. And there's a feminist uh, sociologist called Bev Skeggs who summed it up this way. She summed up Nancy, Nancy Fraser's view this way. A political shift has occurred from redistribution to recognition politics so that those who do not have a recognisable, respectable identity cannot make political claims, i.e. for fairness, upon the state. So if you don't have a recognisable identity, you're out of the discussion, basically. This is, you know, this is the nature of um, identity politics. Now, identity politics comes out of the postmodernized social sciences. Uh, the social sciences became very postmodernized, I guess, because postmodernism is certainly Foucault's an example. Uh, promises to deal very well with social issues, uh, but there's a yeah, there's this problem with class. So, Nancy Fraser said that re redistribution politics has been displaced by recognition politics. And uh, corresponding with that, uh, postmodern disciplines such as sociology, remarkably, Marx arguably founded sociology, and yet sociology has come to the conclusion that there's no such thing as class, or at least some sociologists, that there's no such thing as class. You know, and I've I've been in sort of uh, activist settings where people say there's no such thing as class, which I find quite remarkable. Uh, now. I'll mention also another aspect of this relationship t to class is that um, in the university setting, you get fields like, uh, take postmodern art for example, um, film studies is the example that I like to give. So postmodernism, because it rejects bias and rejects elitism, uh, rejects or claims to re re reject this sort of distinction between high and low art, but as far as I can tell, it's resolved this by turning all low art into high art, <laughs> which seems to be the worst possible outcome. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, you know, you, and you see this when you, well, there's a very good definition of postmodern art that I came across uh, once, which is that a postmodern artwork is when the blurb on the wall describing the artwork is bigger than the artwork itself. <laughs> and so it's very elitist well, so in that. It, what, what sort of art is that? <laughs> postmodern Post, art. Postmodern <coughs> art, sometimes known, known as contemporary art. I suppose so. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there's all these signs that in postmodernism, education is being actually treated as a path to elitism. Ironically, it claims to be anti-elitist. -el yeah. It has uh, various signs of elitism in it. In it this mm -hmm. resolution of mm -hmm. high versus low culture, uh, also obscurantism, as I mentioned before. You know, mm -hmm. that sort of really dense language, impenetrable language, that is the hallmark of, of postmodernism. Um, so, I'll try and gather these threads. I've skipped some things, so hopefully this makes sense. Now, look, I'll, I'll mention just quickly psychiatry again. Psychiatry is a smoking gun at the moment. You know, I said that this issue with the antidepressants is uh, perhaps the, the biggest scandal you've never heard of. There's the, the facts about SSRIs, the fact that they almost certainly are nothing better than placebo, plus you know, the FDA warnings which say that they actually cause suicide. This means they have an infinite cost-benefit ratio. And yet what's really striking to me is not just that very few people say anything. It's striking, for example, that no suicide prevention organisation says anything about this. Mm -hmm. You know, this is remarkable. There's, there's great information in this. You have to ask why this happens. And in general, and I'm a sort of, I'll say I'm a left-wing activist sometimes, um, the left says nothing about any of this, which I find remarkable. And I, I call it, uh, I now describe this as the single biggest issue that the left has never given a shit about. Um, 
So what's the motivation uh, behind all of these these sort of this getting away with nonsense in you know, psychiatry, economics, and so on? How could such flawed areas survive, given all the evidence against them? Uh, well, these failures show that uh, an evidence basis is secondary to what these areas are trying to achieve. Therefore, the, the main motivation must be ideological. It's, you know, they're persisting in spite of evidence. The only question then is, what is the ideology behind all of these fields? Well, I'll, I'll try to sort of draw them, draw them together, nominally quite disparate. For one thing, they all rely on measurements of people, including economics. And as I suggested from John Ioannidis' work in meta-research, increasingly we, it's becoming part of the consensus that it's actually really hard to measure people. And this difficulty creates the room for bias. Uh, I'll mention also, um, for example, psychiatry and psychology and so on are related to the broader social sciences, all these sort of postmodern theoretical areas of academia, in the sense, in at least one sense, psychiatry and psychology displace questions of right, right and wrong, and they replace them with questions of healthy versus unhealthy. Mm. And it's very, it's very clear actually in the history of um, 20th century philosophy that it's been overtaken to quite an extent by psychologists and psychiatrists. So, to name a few, you've got uh, Slavoj Žižek, who's around now, he's trained as a psychologist or psychiatrist. Foucault was trained as a psychotherapist. Lacan, very famously. Guattari. And these are all quite famous postmodern names. So it's, I think, interesting in its own right that um, philosophy has become effectively displaced by these apparent sciences of the mind. Now, what all of these things also have in common is the centrality of perception. Postmodernism is very centred around perception because you know, it has this idea of the many ways of knowing. Uh, so there's always a different perception and, and, and <coughs> one that you're not getting because you're biased and somebody else has a different perception and so on. And this is a form of uh, solipsism, really. You know, the philosophical idea that nothing is really true, we don't really know anything beyond ourselves. Uh, and this is something that Buddhism has again, I mentioned Buddhism, uh, and the New Ageism of the left uh, exhibits a lot of this kind of solipsistic idea, and psychology and psychiatry are quintessentially postmodern because they're explicitly concerned with perception. And all of these areas, well those areas so far don't include economics, but um, I'll also mention that uh, the fundamental thing is they all, including economics, they all either prescribe, especially in the case of economics, or describe the social order. They describe or prescribe how the social order is constructed. They have an impact essentially on uh, politics, I suppose, is one way of putting it really simply. Uh, so I'll skip some bits and say that there is certain things that co-occurred over the last 30 or 40 years. One is the rise of postmodernism, which is intimately related to the rise of the new left, which is the shift of, left from work, of the left from working people to uh, being intellectually centred at universities. Now, you know, Chomsky will regale us all with stories about how in the Depression they still had the idea of uh, working people's educational movements and things like that. And I suppose the WEA, WEA in Sydney might be a, a relic of that. Uh, but in, from the 60s onwards, the left shifted from working people to universities, which are quintessentially middle-class places. They're not full of capitalists and they're not full of poor people. They're quintessentially middle-class mm. places. Uh, there was also the rise of scepticism in support of groups orthogonal to class. So there was a great deal of psycho-scepticism um, for a time coming out of the new left and coming out of postmodern social sciences. But then, remarkably, around 1980, uh, I suppose when homosexuality was removed from the DSM, and the idea of female hysteria was, was roundly mm -hmm. agreed as, as being absurd, um, from about 1980 onwards, which is also that time that people talk about the rise of neoliberalism, um, after groups orthogonal to class escaped 
that sort of hand of psychohegemony, uh, then the psychoscepticism died away. And it's actually become very central, and it is very central in postmodernism. You know, Freud is very central for, um, for no other reason, I think, than because of his style of reasoning, which is very poor reasoning, which is abductive reasoning, mm -hmm. um, which is where you have something you want to explain. It could be any number of things that explain it, that imply that. Um, and you just pick one, basically, and you pick the one that serves your agenda. Uh, another thing that co-occurred is the demise, uh, yeah, the demise of uh, psychoscepticism and the rise of neoliberalism. So all these sort of occurred over the over the same time. Uh, neoliberalism, sorry, yeah. is an old concept. It's not a new. How can it merge together? Well, it, no, it did. It did. It did re, re rise from maybe the mid seventies onwards. So Milton Friedman and the Chicago yeah. Chicago School of Economics. That's neoliberalism in the sense that, well, it's neoclassical, in the sense that Adam Smith and Daniel Ricardo, I think it was Daniel Ricardo? David. David Ricardo. David Ricardo, yeah. Um, were the classical economists, and then, you know, this re-emergence of classical economics was neoclassical or neoliberal economics. So that is, did sort of happen from the 70s onwards. Uh, now I would, you know, my, my, my left wing activism tells me there's a, there is a, a crisis in the West at the moment, mm. Mm. and many are calling it a crisis of capitalism. Oh, but ideology. I think, sorry, more crisis of ideology. Well, I would I would call it yeah I would call it something very similar to that. I, from from the talk up to this point, you might guess that I'm going to say the problem is ultimately one of bourgeois and middle class expertise, expertise <laughs> which emanates from academia. Uh, it is a problem coming from uh, the pillars of what are supposed to be the pillars of civil society. We're at a point now where we have these smoking guns like this issue with SSRIs, where nobody's admitting error and nobody's talking about it, and nobody's taking responsibility for it. And surely this is sort of the hallmark of civil society. Not just that you're, you're right all the time, but you are wrong sometimes, and when you're wrong, you admit yeah. it and you make, you, know, you, you make amends, you fix things. But this doesn't happen. Uh, and it seems instead that, that the, the, the real core concern is for um, uh, careerism. As I said, education being used as a kind of path to elitism. Um, and if these disciplines are not producing valid information, what are they producing? Well, they're producing things that people can say are expertise and get paid a lot of money for, potentially, and then they're not accountable when it turns out it's not true. And since we're in the human society, I'll, I'll mention that uh, this is a kind of re revision back to pre-enlightenment or pre-modernist ways of knowing, and these kinds of experts then become essentially a, a priest class again, uh, escaping the, the purview of um, modernist rational accountability. And so, so, well, why is all, all of this happening? Well, there's always been the centrality of narratives and fascism, for example, European fascism, as I understand it, had a lot to do with narratives of a particularly sort of small business class who felt put upon by the big, um, you know, there were all these parasites everywhere and they were these heroic people that everybody was just sucking, sucking the blood out of and so on. But of course, uh, postmodernism is all about narratives, and in fact, it brings this idea of narratives into the university and into academia. And what I think is going on is there is a, a real centrality of narratives here, and it's part of the oldest debate in in the world, which is the nature versus nurture debate, or as <coughs> sociologists call it, agency versus structure. And this is so contested this debate because it threatens to explain the construction of the social world how the social order is constructed. So one group of people wants to say, well, the social order is constructed through individual success and failure. And the other group says, no, well, hang on, what about um, individual uh, uh, privilege and underprivilege uh, and fairness and lack of fairness and so on? Mm -hmm. And uh, a striking thing that I've noticed, so, you know, there's a great deal of talk about the decline of the middle class in, in the US after the... GFC hit, which I find really bizarre because it implies something about how poverty is treated. People have always been poor, 
And yet that gets completely overlooked in this discussion about the decline of the middle class. Mm. As though, well, they're always poor, they deserve to be poor. Um, we've always tolerated, we'll tolerate it again. The real issue is the decline of the middle class. Mm. When in fact, you know, people exist in a distribution and those people who were always poor were probably going through because they were in more extreme circumstances to begin with, what the middle class in the US are going through now. So, uh, how I'll sort of try to tie neoliberalism, postmodernism, and psychohegemony together, um, and this idea of the broader social sciences, the postmodernized social sciences, is I'll, say, I'll suggest to you that they've enabled neoliberalism, uh, that their emphasis is on perception, in other words, they have a solipsistic nature, and uh, they've done this by imploring some individuals to be content with only internal change. The wholesale displacement of redistribution politics by recognition politics means that internal change is demanded only of those without recognised identities. This is a consequence of identity politics and postmodernism. They have explicitly abandoned class as a concept in an act of hypocritical bias. These are quintessentially middle class institutions, very concerned with bias, and then abandoning class as a concept. So that the poor do not have a recognised identity. So effectively, a detente has been uh, has emerged between the postmodernized new left and capitalism. In other words, over the last three or four decades, a de facto negotiation among the middle class social sciences has occurred regarding who has permission to blame social structures for their hardships and uh, why their life doesn't work out the way it does, and who only has permission to blame their own agency. So it's really about working out, yeah, doling out permission. And, uh, well, I'll just mention there is potentially this great environmental endgame. So, of course, all of this is a millennia-old debate. Uh, um, but potentially, if you, if you believe in the science of global warming and so on, that it's man-made, uh, this represents an endgame to this millennia-old debate. I, I will <laughs> conclude now. Um, with a couple of quotes, if that's okay. Uh, so, firstly, well, actually, no, I'll just, I'll just give you one quote. This quote is from John F. Kennedy. Uh, so, what's going on here really is a kind of myth-making. This is a word I'm hearing more and more, that uh, these forms of expertise are making myths upon which to hang the ideas of the construction of the social order. Mm. But very often they turn out not to be true. And John F. Kennedy said... The great enemy of the truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contri contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Belief in myths allows the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Mark Evans, and uh, there will be questions, oh, as you anticipated, <laughs> and uh, you'll be happy to hear, you'll be happy to hear that supper might be ten minutes later, but that's all right, you will still eat and drink and be merry, but only after the questions are over, because we come here primarily to expand our consciousness, not so much to eat and drink, although that does help. Now, next week, in the Open Forum series. You're welcome to come here any Wednesday, by the way. Some of you might have come here specially to hear Mark Evans, and I congratulate you for that because his talk has been well worth hearing. However, you're welcome to come any Wednesday. The Open Forum is an old institution with its arms wide open, um, like St. Peter's Gate, um, only they're not stone. Now, uh, next Wednesday, the world in 2050, don't you wish you knew and maybe you'll be here to experience it. <laughs> and what is to come? Uh, well, I'm Nostradamus's nephew, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> uh, speaker next Wednesday, the 25th, Mr. Bob Vinicom. He's spoken here before. He's a fascinating social commentator and human rights campaigner, and he would like to share his perceptions with you. 25th, Wednesday, one week, here. Same time, same place. Don't have to book. 2nd of October, armchair discussion only. 9th of October, alternative dispute resolution, the way to go, 
Mr. Tick Hock Lim, mediator, social worker. <laughs> Thank you, and that's the 9th of October. Now, I have something here which is not printed, which I will tell you about, and you'll have to, uh, you'll have to uh, make a mental note of this, but I think you should know about it because it's very close to what you might be interested in, a lot of you. Neuroscience, a window into who you are. That's the topic, okay? It's not printed yet, so you'll have to put it in your diaries. Wednesday, the 6th of November. I know it's a long way ahead. It is only organized today, so it's not printed yet. Neuroscience, comma, a window into who you are. And the speaker, you won't be able to spell it, don't worry, just call her, Sa <laughs> call her Sara, S-A-R-A, -A, that's the Italian pronunciation, Sara di Amicio Belli. And just call her Sara, she'll be quite happy with that. Fascinating lady, Sara de Amicio Belli is the speaker on the 6th of November, Neuroscience, a window into who you are. Now we'll take questions. So, David, can I do publicity? Uh, well, yeah, very, very briefly. <laughs> very briefly. <laughs> very briefly. I mean, no, I'm not publicizing my talk, but you want to come. <laughs> you know, um, uh, oh, a couple of things tomorrow. Uh, Pat O'Shea is speaking at a law school, UNSW. So Pat O'Shea, the uh, controversial okay. about you say Six o'clock in the law school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other one, Buddhism and Modernity mm -hmm. at the law school in the, um, Sydney University. What time? Six o'clock. Well, I think the best thing to do... Uh, I think, I think I'm just sharing... Thing, yeah, I know you are. But the best thing to do is for people who are interested in either of those two yeah, events, but I'm yeah, so to talk writing. to you afterwards, this and gentleman. And also uh, on Tuesday, uh, David Suzuki is speaking at the... Mm -hmm. oh, You're a mind of information. All right. All right, Lim. You're going to be oh, now. Excuse me, please. Hi. <laughs> Excuse me, please. Uh, anybody interested in either of those two meetings, you'll see Lim after the meeting, and that's... that's him. <laughs> right over then. Uh, look, thank you for your patience. Questions? And yes, at the back, at the back, come on. Yes, yes, thank you. Thanks, David. Yeah, Mark, we have met before, I know. And, uh, anyway, yeah, the, the first one, basically, is a yes or no answer. Are you speaking on the ABC 702 at 11 a.m. tomorrow? Is it you, Mark Arons? No, it's another Mark Arons. Oh, there's actually a there's a famous communist who has the same yeah. name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah. A different a spelling. A different, a different spelling. Yeah. Double, yeah. I'm a H-R-E-N-S-C's yeah. uh, double so A-R-O-S. That's not you. No, it's no, not, no, not you. No, that's what I needed to know. Anyway, I don't know if you mentioned, I five minutes late, didn't you? you? Did you mention about the, the long-term use of antidepressants, sedatives, you know? You know, can make you prone to uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. No, I, 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 no, no, that has come out recently. Mm, yeah, mm. it's a physical I'm not, I haven't, I haven't heard of that. I mean, as well as smoking and boozing and stuff yeah. like that, which is generally recognised by exactly. like, these other medications. Mm, mm. And I'm not. Did you say sedatives? Yeah, yes. sedatives. Yes. Yes. Things yes. are coming. I thought you said sedatives. Well, the benzodiazepines are, yeah. are absolutely rotten. I mean, they're, and they're they're only, they only have a, a window of about two weeks in which they're actually worth taking at all. And then they're one of the most addictive drugs around. Yeah. I didn't mention, yeah. you know, here's something that boggles my mind, yeah. is that, um, you know, that we went through this period of history, in the, particularly in the 60s, and there was a great deal of uh, women's suicide associated with this mother's little helper period, uh, with these dangerous benzodiazepines. Well, now, of course, and I, I volunteer with homeless people, through the uh, free health system, homeless people are being drugged in, in massive numbers with benzodiazepines to, just to kind of help them cope with being homeless, which is, again, is a rotten solution. Mm. But, but, and these drugs are terrible. But, but would you say there's any place for these at all? I mean, you, you're, you're not completely condemning them wholesale, but you probably, are you just saying they're being overused or abused? Well, or, I would certainly say in the yeah. case of yeah. SSRIs and tricyclic antidepressants, yeah, yeah. It's pretty clear that they actually have no benefit yeah. that a sugar pill doesn't. Yeah. Um, in the case of many of the others, we don't really know how they work, and it looks like they just yeah. work through brain damage in yeah. some sense, um, which is, you know, philosophically but questionable. Even, but even a placebo effect is worth having if it's effective. Yeah, but if you've got a, an infinite cost-benefit ratio, yeah, I would I say that's a pretty bad policy. Yeah. Yeah. Then give them, <laughs> then give them, give them sugar yes, pills. Uh, yeah, exactly. Phil. <laughs> yes, Phil. Yes, Phil. Yes, Mark, that was a, uh, an encyclopedic discussion yeah. tonight. You went for about an hour and a quarter. 
and that's fine. You mentioned a huge number of topics and yeah. issues. Um, I left university some time before you did, and you mentioned things like identity. I, I, I've heard the phrase postmodernism and yeah. redistribution politics, etc., and applied <coughs> to Marxism and so on, socialism. But when you're talking about recognition politics or identity politics, I've never heard that phrase before. Mm. I've never heard of the, the, the nurture and um, nature debate described as agency versus mm. structure. That's what sociologists call it. Mm. Now. That's what they call it now, do they? Oh, I don't now, know. When they started calling it, this is what they call it. Okay. Mm. So agency anyway, is an anyway, individual anyway, agency anyway, and structures. Round, you rounded off your talk tonight with those sorts of issues. Can you, for people like me and others who left, who if they didn't go to university at all, at all, or left university a long time ago, just in about two or three minutes, give us a headline or a take-home message tonight of what it was you were talking about? <laughs> oh, in, about okay. in about two or three minutes, okay. what, no what's, your basic, what's your basic point? What are you trying mm. to say? Okay. Well, my intention, my intention was, uh, and I, as I said, I was trying to cram. I'm going to struggle to cram all this in, and I had to cut lots out. My intention is to talk about um, ranges of expertise, particularly social sciences, and the broader social sciences. So that includes economics, psychology and psychiatry, as well as sociology, uh, gender studies, and a whole bunch of other things, to <coughs> discuss the problems with those and the scope for bias and in fact outright politicisation, which I didn't deal with very much. Which postmodernism says is okay, does it? Uh, well, po post, you know, postmodernism, in, in the sense that it, you know, prefers multiple, talks about multiple ways of seeing things and, and rejects grand theories. Um, postmodernism, it, it's not possible to have a debate in postmodernism. Because no, it's not. Because it, it, everything the debate boils down to no, just just essentially yelling or rhetorically yelling at your opponent. Because mm. if you have no no respect for for rationalism, uh, you can't have this sort of dialectical method where you go backwards <coughs> and forwards and try to come to a solution. So it just becomes uh, ideological yelling. And I, you know, in that sense, postmodern social science, which has achieved, you know. It's part of achievements. Like the new left is part of achievements, you know, f in feminism and in um, gay rights and so on. And they're of course, in, you know, incredibly important. But they're also what's happened with the new left in academia is that it's or postmodern academia is that it's become a kind of academic activism. You know, like an academic counterpart to judicial activism. So you know, when when when. Um, courts find something and they add so much interpretation to the law that they're effectively legislating from the courtroom. It's mm -hmm. something like that, academic activism, where they're not bound by any need to have evidence or to, to have a um, self-consistent position or whatever. It just becomes activism, you know, and, and that's good. I'm an activist, but, you know, that's separate from academia. It should be. Okay, so you're saying we have these experts in in all these different fields of the social sciences, and what follows from that? What and and so uh, what's happened? I think there's a there's a bunch of things that's happened. People talk about the last thirty or forty years. This comes up again and again. Mm -hmm. Discussions about the global financial crisis, particularly about neoliberalism. But there are a number of things that have happened: the rise of the new left and all these postmodernism in universities. And what's happened is they become. Uh, very obsessed with bias, but completely ignorant of their own potential class bias, because mm -hmm. they're quintessentially middle class places. And so what they've done is they've, they've set up a whole lot of forms of expertise, or a whole lot of technologies, as Foucault would say, um, which so often turn out to be rubbish, but which end up justifying the social order, and particularly particular end up being very damaging to the poor. Mm -hmm. and and this is very explicit because they've explicitly rejected class as a concept. So they're, they're, they're saying everybody else is biased, but not them are biased themselves in saying yeah, so. Yeah, that's one of the ironies. There's a whole bunch mm. of ironies involved in it. Yeah. And now, Mark, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, Mark, would you be saying something like this?
the masking of elitism via social control, mm. via disciplines based on the jargon of a new priesthood? Would yeah, that be something yeah. like what you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'm asking you whether that happens yeah, to yeah. coincide uh, yeah. with what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. The masking of elitism via social control. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 absolutely. You're talking about, you're talking about elitism in a new form. Mm. The, elitism the, doesn't the, recognize that it's elitism. No, but no. it's, it's camouflaged. Mm. Yeah. It's Camouflage. Even for itself. From itself, yeah. yeah. Like this, okay. Now, this gentleman would like to. Uh, Sorry, I, as, as one of the new priests. <laughs> oh, I, I, I don't really quite know where to begin. I've, I, I, I've just arrived in Australia. Um, and having, having been a sociologist, psychologist, philosopher, economic, e economist. Yeah and have just finished doing an MSc in Security Studies at University College London, which involved politics and economics. And whilst I agree with your conclusion, I, I'm kind of like flummoxed as to kind of like how you've got there amongst all of these... I, I, th I think I need to see a yeah. bigger... Yeah, yeah no, it's really... Right. Right. A, 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 a bigger outline of your argument. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think a lot of it was quite, it was quite kind of lost in having to yeah. curtail it, it's possibly. Yeah. No, mm. it's very true. But, uh, I really yeah. struggle. Yeah. Sorry. I'd have His to book will be out soon, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is John. Yes, yes. John. Mark, um, just to mention briefly that Professor Fukuyama yeah, and yes. John Keane gave a little spiel on ABC about the middle classes being responsible or certainly influencing the downgrading of democracy in the Western world. Mm, yeah, yeah. A very interesting program yeah, yeah. to listen yeah, to. Right. Uh, quite exceptional yeah. in the way it was structured and the material that they produced. Now, getting back to your Is that very... Is Francis Fukuyama? Who, which Fukuyama? Professor Fuku Fukuyama. Francis Fukuyama. Francis Fukuyama. Francis the end, That's end, right. end, of, yeah. end of his <coughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Now, getting back to your short title, I, I only got to the point of uh, uh, looking at neoliberalism, and uh, I had a quick browse at Thatcher Regan, um, uh, decided I couldn't take too much of that, and went on to <laughs> Suzanne George, who gave a, a presentation in 1999 in Bangkok, a short history of neoliberalism, which is a shocker. The point is there's a, there's a common thread in that whole history in just the politics, let alone psychiatry and all the other elements that you mentioned, socialism, uh, <laughs> social science, I should say, mm -hmm. and the other array of facts that you've reported. They're very easy to accept, but the, the common thread is vested interest, not yeah. the names you're giving it, well, with power, with yeah, accumulative yeah, yeah, power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how many springing points, which are the dots yeah. that have to be connected, that the public has to spring from, yeah. when the power from different dots can be played against one another. Yeah. Well, the only, the only, I mean, yeah, that's exactly right. Well, I, that's what I'm trying to say, except I'm also speaking of the centrality of academia in all of this. You know, so I've not but spoken... But ironically, you cite academia yes. in support of undermining academia. Yeah. What's wrong so, with that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's not a contradiction. Isn't it a contradiction? No, it's not. No, no it's not. No, I mean, I can cite some academia that makes sense, and I can well, reject academia. Well, in that academia case, then that's, that's just your postmodernist story, isn't it? No, that's, that's your oh, postmodernist oh, okay. assessment of my... That's no, that's your yeah. postmodernist story. Excuse me, Mark, oh, uh, pardon me, whose question were you answering? I don't... <laughs> Sorry. We got lost there somewhere. <laughs> I, I, I think you have uh, largely acknowledged the difficulty by your, your responses that this is a grim reality uh, and you are su substantiating in a very constructive way serious problems which are evaded because they don't fit the objective of the vested mm -hmm. interest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Okay, yes Angela. Um, yeah Mark, um, thank you, it was a very interesting speech per usual. Um, it just strikes me that a lot of the, um, of the issues you raised um, are across the spectrum with a lot of, not just um, the social sciences, the helping sciences, but mm. also in 
things like art and, contem and contemporary serious, so-called serious classical music. Because basically, in the late 90s, in the early 20th century, well, up until the, the late 20th century, the good fight was fought for the social sciences, right? It went from being a society which in the early industrial revolution didn't care about anybody yeah. mm -hmm. to being a society that embraced everybody with the, the welfare state, etc. Mm. So the good fight was fought. The same thing happened with classical music. Mm. Everybody wrote all the best tunes, and then the only thing left to do was to destroy music, you know, yeah. Stravinsky yeah. and, and the whole yeah. band lot, until there was no music left. And the same thing happened with art. Once yeah. Leonardo and Rembrandt had done it all, and Manet and Monet, then what do you do? You have to destroy it. And the same thing that strikes me that the same thing has happened in the so-called social sciences because there's really all the all the ideas have been thought and said and done. So all now you can do is turn them upside down, convolute them, make the words longer and longer and longer, and basically destroy destroy all the underpinning things that have created that world. I mean, yeah. David Williamson said absolute, it all in dead white males. Basically, you 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 cut it away and you cut it away and you make the words longer and longer and the concepts longer and the and symposiums and the conferences longer, so nobody has the faintest idea what they're talking about. And, and then, it, then it sort of comes to a grinding halt, just like art has come to a halt, in my opinion, so-called serious yeah. art. It comes to a halt where you go to the art gallery and you see one squiggly line that an ant could do, and that's called... That's deconstructed, that's though. Something that's one right. way or the other, so, isn't it? I mean, but, Untitled number five. Exactly, and it's the same thing because those thoughts have been thought and they've been achieved and done. And, and the real fight now for the social sciences, it, it, I believe, is to go out to the 99% rest of the world that has nothing and, and to, to bring yeah. Fabian socialism or whatever it is that brought the good life to us to them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, naturally. So, um, I, I'd just like to um, mention that it wasn't my intention to get too much into art. I mentioned art a little bit because I was trying to convey some of the spirit postmodernism and also I, I like to pick on film studies because of how it how it so obviously turns low culture into high culture which is sort of the exact opposite of what the promise of postmodernism was uh, but the real point is 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 to think about elitism in that um, and how that relates back to, to class uh, but the broader the reason why you know what postmodernism has in, in common with things like psychology and psychiatry and Buddhism and so on and so on is the centrality of perception and then the centrality of perception is is, is very important for controlling populations <coughs> and and telling them that they have to reconfigure their perception the problem is not with the world the problem is with their perception of the world mm. and then you end up with you know this paves the way for neoliberalism to do whatever it wants and so people recognize now in the US uh, you know they say the, the American dream is dead Maybe it never existed. And there's, a, there's an author called Barbara Ehrenreich who wrote a really good book published in England under the title uh, Smile or Die. <laughs> published in Australia under the title Bright Sided. And you know, she writes about uh, things like positive psychology and all of, these for, all of these technologies, these forms of expertise that have <laughs> people going and trying to work out what's wrong with themselves and fix themselves. And, and adjust their perception and reconfigure themselves internally when the problem was society mm. the whole time. Mm. Okay, yes, Nikki. Um, so, as, uh, my understanding is like uh, that uh, English is my fourth language, <laughs> so I have to tell you. Uh, my understanding is that you were telling us that sci not only social science, but science at generally, the whole science, is just there to serve the middle, the middle class, nothing for the poor. No. <laughs> no. no. I, th this is, you know, this is a sort of debate. There, there was a debate called the Science Wars, and I can't remember now if I got to mention Alan Soka, who... Um, who was a physicist. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to read his quote at the end, but then I think I realised I didn't mention him at all in the end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did I? Yeah. No, I don't think you did. Circle and Brickmont. Yeah, so, so Carl so, and Brickmont, yeah. exactly. Well, Intellectual yeah. impostures. Mm. So they, they wrote a book uh, critiquing postmodernism, or 
but only what postmodernists had said about physics. Um, I had, a, I mean, there's some amazing quotes, absolutely absurd quotes. You know, they, they Lacan said that the, basically said the erect penis is, is equivalent to the square root of minus one. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, you know, absolute nonsense. But it's a great... Did you come to that conclusion? Well, you know, it's, it's all sort of form as a function, I suppose. There's, there's lots of flower, flowery language and it's bamboozling. Mm. Joke doesn't even work but in French. So. So the the, the pun wrote... Oh, right. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, so um, sorry. Um, so the, the issue, um, well, I mean, personally, I, I think it's quite clear that hard sciences and soft sciences are different. And the way they're different is because, you know, and I've had this debate with new leftists and so on. The reason they're different is because, uh, yes, hard science can be politicised in the sense that, you know, physicists, lots of physicists work on weapons. Mm. But weapons don't work unless there's truth behind them. You know, in, um, the problem with physics is not that it's too ideological. The problem with physics potentially is that it's not ideological enough. Mm -hmm. It's the opposite problem from the soft sciences, where there's great scope for bias and, and an influx of ideology. Um, so the and and so physics uh, in physics the, the problem is not the production of truth, but the direction in which the science goes in discovering that truth. Uh, it can produce truth, and they may might be very dangerous truths. But it's a different problem to soft sciences. When you're making statements that are barely testable or not testable at all sometimes, or just you know, essentially forms of activism, mm -hmm. um, there it's it's a it's a very different problem. There, the problem is actually the production of truth, mm -hmm. fundamentally. Not what to do with it. My, my, my yeah. question might be very appropriate now. Right at the very end, I mean, there was another question I have, but that's a half an hour discussion about Foucault. But right at the very end, you mentioned climate science. Yeah, yeah. And that could have been the beginning of a whole new lecture because we had something that, on the one hand, a lot of people would, would assert that it is mm. hard science. And, yeah. and mm. at the moment, we have a furious clash yeah. going on mm. between yeah. The Guardian and The Daily Mail and all of these other yeah. um, between climate sceptics. Climate skeptic newspapers. Geologists yes. versus, you know, like. Yeah. But it's, uh, there's mm. a, a bombardment uh, being mm. happening mm. in the press in mm. anticipation mm. of the report coming out on the 17th of September that asserted that um, that, that, that that the climate, uh, global warming was was was, was um, m m human beings were uh, responsible for it. That that was the. That's what we expected to hear in the report. So in, in anticipation of that, we just got, uh, there were a lot of different uh, mm. things. The Guardian brought out an article called The Five Stages of Climate Denial, mm. a, a little bit in reminiscent of Elizabeth Kubler asked, like, let's be thinking people. Uh, and, then, uh, and then at the same time, uh, Murdoch Press and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> business uh, as usual, uh, was was saying no 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 this is absolute rubbish and both yeah, were Gina uh, uh, yeah trying to <laughs> it's it's like what you were saying they were trying to build their pedestals mm. uh, higher and higher so that the credibility would be there first to debunk climate science on one uh, one side and and uh, apparently mm. with the Guardian to say listen to it so. Um, I mean, that would have been good to hear, hear you talk for another five minutes. Just another five about, minutes? Just another about, hour and a half. Yes, <laughs> even just five minutes, because it, it was on the tip of my tongue, climate science, because there yeah. we have a real uh, argument about, yeah. uh, I think it was Al Gore said once, uh, um, the purpose of politicians was to turn scientific fact into theory. Yeah. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If you look at the CO2 levels, though, there's really been not a dramatic increase. Like my dad's a geologist, and um, he reckons that we're headed towards a global cooling. Sure, there's mm. climate change, mm. and there's you know mm. spikes, but 
if you look at it from back when you know the dinosaurs were around, it there really hasn't been that much change. I've got loads of stuff on that if you're interested. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the Ice Age in the Northern Hemisphere is part of the scenario. Oh, I know. The, 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 there is climate change. It's more complicated than just yeah. one yeah, thing. But if you're interested in it, I've got loads of oh, yeah. stuff on it. <laughs> it's been my dad's pet project uh, for the last your five years. <laughs> would you, if you two ladies could just put it on hold. For <laughs> Sorry. Um, I would yeah. like there's two gentlemen on the side. But could he re could he reply to the question? Oh I well, know. I'm sure he, he has, just a, a he has that option. Yes. About yeah. how this uh, how, how does credibility uh, war. Um, yeah. That's uh, <laughs> it's actually really it's a really tough question. It, 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 might, it might debunk everything I've just said. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, look, I mean, personally, there are asp Okay, personally, I've. I think it's. I think it's fair to say that the science on climate, science on climate debate has become not. There's this whole media sideshow aspect mm -hmm. to it, um, and there's there's a whole lot of name calling. You know, there's this dynamic in society Hysteria. where certain people are sidelined as being obstacles to, to progress and obstacles to modernity. And to some, I mean, I think it's fair to say that the the left has been doing that. Mm. But having said that, look, I have a background in physics, and I, it's, climate science is very complex. Mm. And I, I have reservations about statements like so many scientists mm. believe this, because I think what most scientists believe in is the the method, mm -hmm. the the whole, you know, the, they go well. Okay, there's a peer review system. I trust the peer review system. This authoritative paper was published in Science or in Nature. Uh, I trust that. And there, there's a whole lot of trust built on um, the processes within science. Mm -hmm. Now, but fundamentally, measuring temperatures was settled in the ni 19th century. So there's no problem there. Mm -hmm. um, there's the mathematics of, of record breaking was settled in the 19th century or before. It's very interesting, by the way, if you ever want to look into it. Mm. Um, it's related to um, number theory, but um, so we know that we know that there is climate change. Um, the only debate is whether it's <coughs> man-made. Now, people, what's mm. one of the telling things is that people have shifted from a position of saying there's no climate change mm. to saying, well, okay, there is climate change, but it's not man-made. And there is, uh, uh, you know, a, a debate I would say about narratives there. Mm -hmm. And so, if you compare. Compare Australia and the US. These are the two countries that were last to sign the Kyoto Protocol. The US never signed it, and Australia signed it when, when Rudd became PM. But um, they have a whole lot of things in common, and one of the things they have in common, besides this being the last to sign the Kyoto Protocol, is that uh, narrative politics is really central in both countries. And what's really threatening about the politics of climate change is that the whole middle class lifestyle is being implicated. And uh, mm. people have come to expect that, and in countries like Australia and the US, have come to expect um, to be flattered by politicians. Mm -hmm. And in Australia, you know, with things like middle class welfare, this is basically a, a, um, a kind of a pat on the back, a recognition of one's own narrative of hardship and, and, and pulling oneself up by one's own bootstraps. There's all sorts yeah. of crazy ironies there. But... Um, so because of this centrality of this sort of large middle class, the narrative of the large middle classes in these countries, I think it's very threatening for these people to then confront this idea that says, well, actually, maybe you're a burden. You know, there's this idea of pulling mm -hmm. yourself up by bootstraps and uh, this idea of everybody else being parasitic and a burden, but, but <laughs> we're heroic <laughs> and self-actualized. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly this idea comes along that threatens all of these people with this idea that they're actually a burden too. Mm -hmm. And they're a burden on possibly the planet and indirectly on all sorts of other people and people in the third world on the other side of the planet. So that political dynamic also gets in the way. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's true that, um, well, it's true that temperatures are rising um, or have been rising. It's true potentially that there are other effects from the whole the ozone layer from 
solar cycles and so on, that all might add up to, to do something. So it's quite complex. But definitely, well, it stands to reason anyway that, that you should reduce pollution yeah. as a long-term yes. strategy anyway. Yeah. So, but then all this narrative politics stuff gets in the way. But it's hardly Freud. Hardly Freud. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just Maybe. kicks the one that <laughs> right. the whole way. <laughs> Excuse me, Lim would like to ask you a question. After listening to you, one becomes very depressed. Give <laughs> 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 him some of those oh. tablets. <laughs> 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 because I no, 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 just the speaker. Nobody else. I, you know, I come from the British left, you know, so sort of, um, in, in, in my knowledge is in philosophy and sociology, and I'm a, I was a social worker for, for the past two years, but now I've got my pension now, so I'm out of the <laughs> Is it, could it be quite safely, re, re, your title, like, as I was just implied, you know, becomes an a, a crisis of, of, of ideology, and maybe like Durkheim says, a form of enemy has set in, that new formation has not come about, or you can reconstruct after your deconstruct, deconstruction of where we are going, you know, um, having synthesized all it together. Uh, the end of ideology, the, 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 the Francis Fukuyama stuff, that there's now no, no, no more Cold War, but now we have the cultural wars, as Samuel Huntington says, what, what, what do you say to that? But, um, well, it is easy to have this bourgeois kind of debate of, you know, very simplistic that, uh, uh, form of re relativism. And in fact, I went to a, a lecture which, uh, which uh, yeah, hang on, hang on, hang on. Can you wait? So the, the question then is that, that perhaps we could then reconstruct a new ideology, you know, having a look at this uh, 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 form of uh, uh, re relativism, which you cannot, as you say, you can't have an argument with. Uh, is there, you know, now the, the new uh, millennium, the new stage of a cultural war? Thank you. Uh, well, <laughs> I, th I think there is, and, and as I said, you know, this there is the potential of a ecological end game, which is going to force an outcome. And obviously, being stuck in ide ideological wars is not going to progress it. Um, you see, you see that played out, like the. the in Copenhagen, the agreement that they never reached there, the sticking point was between first world and third world countries, as I understand it. Mm. Both of them essentially sort of kind of trying to blackmail the other. The first world saying, well, <clears throat> first world wanting to use this environmental end game to uh, lock into place inequality and say, okay, mm. nobody's allowed to burn anything anymore, because that's really what this is all about, the end of burning stuff. Mm. Nobody's allowed to burn anything mm. anymore. And we've made great industrial gains through burning e easy stuff, but you're not allowed to anymore. <laughs> so that locks in inequality. Mm. And then, you know, the, the third world says mm. the opposite. Well, you've gotten away with that, so we need to get That's special right. dis yeah. dispensation. Yeah. So, so there's a sort of deep ideological uh, problem, you know, with trying to solve this potential end game. Um, but... You know, we also live in an age of post-scarcity. There's more than enough food in the world to feed everybody. There's issues like work. You know, everybody was promised that through automation people would work less. And, of course, you know, capitalism is not really capable mm. of dealing with that. People, ultimately, as, as things become more and more automated, ought to expect to be working less and less. There's just less and less need for people. And society has to figure out how to how to deal with that and so that you know this sort of cues for a radical change in in economics and society that are almost being forced upon us by things like potential environmental end game mm -hmm. and um, uh, automation superfluous of 
superfluousness of human labour, and so on. I don't know if that answered your question. Like the witch initiating socialism in the first world after they've made their fortunes. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, that's Victor. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the world as we know it today is because of the Western or European peoples from Galileo to Newton to Faraday to Thomas Edison and the list would go on and on. Um, the reason why I believe we have a crisis in the West is because of, in a globalised world we actually get all of our stuff now made in Asia where we don't actually value at anything anymore in the country or in the Western world for that fact. The left likes to use terms like progressive. I actually believe we're actually regressing. What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, well, part of my, my point for the talk was that these elements of the left or the new left, the left as a very middle class voice now, have, have left behind these, these kinds of issues. Chris, Chris Hedges is an interesting person to listen to. I, I like him anyway. Mm. He, he talks in, in the American context, and he he's, he talks a lot about manufacturing as a as a you know a loss of security and it has all these great ramifications. And by the way, he says things that kind of align with what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> with if I maybe if I had 14 hours, I could encapsulate <laughs> it properly. But um, yeah, I mean I. I think I think that's right. There's an interesting um, fact from um, the Wealth of Nations. You know, Adam Smith only used the term um, "free hand of the the invisible hand of the market" once. So you can download it and you can search it. I've done that. You know, search through the, an electronic copy, and you find that term used in only one context. And it's completely taken out of context the way it's discussed now. And in fact, the context in which he talks about this is um, he's talking about globalism before it was an issue. He's asking the question, why uh, would we not import, uh, export jobs to Portugal from England? And he says, well, because there's a home bias. A good Englishman is going to um, have pay some mind to his, to his, to his neighbour and is not just going to export all those jobs because it's cheaper. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of trade-offs there as well, of course, because globalisation does actually... Capi glo globalised capitalism exploits differences between economies and sort of raises up the lower and lowers mm. the higher. Oh, like I used the word exploit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, Which is what you know, they've been doing since the slave trade. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it is raising, it is raising the, the average income of Chinese people, for example, mm. quite rapidly. But, but it always comes at someone else's. That's, yeah, that's right. And then, you know... No, I don't think it does. That's, yeah, that's wrong. Yeah. No? no. Yeah. Okay, well, just a minute. This is your, your court, so your answer. Oh, no, that's... Overall, global wealth has increased since the last few hundred years, definitely, it's gone up. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that's, I don't think those two are mutually exclusive. You know, you... Um, but you, you are also redistributing that oh, yeah, yeah. overall growing wealth. You know. yeah. And so, obviously, you know, working people in the first world end up suffering. I mean, just look at Detroit. Just <laughs> declare <laughs> itself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll end up doing different kinds of work. Right. Maybe. <laughs> if, if they're lucky. If, Lots of jobs aren't automated away. Okay. They're Maybe they can get a, a job where, where they can preach complete rubbish and then have no... <laughs>